Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We've got a pretty good group here in spite of it. The rain is on. We bad just get baptized. We're going to have to be sprinkled. That's the rain. Uh, in the Sunday school today, we had, I'm going to open it, had 18. And of all you folks that come a little earlier, we had quite a bit more than that. We might like become next week early. Our, our attendance says 18. Uh, we didn't have any place to put a hold on the attendance. Our offering was $1,286.25. Birthdays and anniversaries, we have three birthdays. Did anyone have a birthday that I didn't have listed? And I didn't have any, I'll read them in a minute. Did anyone have an anniversary that I didn't have listed? Okay. The birthdays was Marilyn Garrison, Bubba Hunt, and Tim Blackstock. So if you happen to run into these, any of these, wish them a happy birthday. Tell them that we'd love to have them back in church. I do have a story I want to share. Uh, we have a, a visiting minister here with us today, and in this story, there was a visiting minister at the man's church. And they had the evening hymns, and the pastor stood up, went to the pulpit, and before he gave his sermon, he said, I've got an old friend, a childhood friend that's here that's a pastor, and I'd like him to come and say a few words if you'd like to. And the man went to the, up there and said, I'm glad to be here. And he told this story. A father, his son, and a friend of his son were sailing off the Pacific coast. And even though the father was a very experienced sailor, and the son was pretty good, he knew quite a bit about it, a very strong gale came up. And he ended up capsizing the boat. And the three of them went into the real rough stormy seas there. And the, the uh, father was close enough to the boat that he got, got back and got a hold of it and he had a, one of those life rings with a rope on it. And here was the son and the friend of the son out there. And he only had one rope. You know, what would you do? He had that, that uh, decision to make. And he hesitated just for a moment and looked at the son. He knew his son was a Christian. And his son, I love you. And he knew his friend, his son's friend was not. And he threw the rope to the devil. And the, uh, he pulled him in, but before he could throw it again, the sun disappeared in a terrible way, he said. And there were two teenagers in the church sitting up on the close to the front. You know, we're, we're back, back to you Baptists. We like to sit close to the back normally. But uh, they were sitting fairly close to the front. They'd been sort of ignoring him. And when he said that, everybody threw it to the other boy. Uh, they sort of stood up, stood prayed up, and started paying attention to it. Uh, the father, he continued, uh, knew his son was stepping to turn to the immediately to Jesus, and he couldn't bear the thought of the other boy stepping into eternity without Jesus. And how great is the love of God that he should do the same for us. Our Heavenly Father sacrificed his only begotten son so we could be saved. I urge you to accept his offer to rescue you and take hold of the lifeline he's throwing out for you in this service today. With that, the old man went back and sat down. The pastor again went to the pulpit and delivered his sermon with an invitation to end, and no one responded. With the moments of the end of the service, the two boys went to the old man. And they said, you know, that's a nice story, but I don't think it's very realistic. Nobody would do that. They would throw it to their own son instead of throwing it to, to the friend. And he said, well, you've got a point there. And he sort of smiled. He said, you know, I know it isn't very real, realistic, but I'm here today to tell you this story gives me a glimpse of what it must have been like for God to give up his son. You see, I was that father, and your pastor here was my son's friend. So, you know, would, would we have the courage to do that, think like that, that his son was going to heaven and he knew the boy was. Uh, I'll turn over to Miss Sandy and Miss Susan. We're so glad to have her here today. Let's all stand and sing in number 599, soon and very soon.
that of course this is our month for Golden Missions. Uh, and I think it used to be called Golden State Mission, but I think now it's just Golden Missions because that's the last name of the person that started. So today we're going to um, specifically look at our collegiate um, ministries and pray for Tennessee collegiate believers that they may faithfully give their hearts and ways to the Lord throughout their college careers. Pray that Baptist Collegiate Ministry Specialists may hold to <coughs> and grow their love for our Tennessee universities, students, faculty, and staff. We really need to pray for our colleges because sometimes they're being taught to teach things that are what needs to be taught out of the Bible. And we need to pray for our strong youth that they will have a strong, um, a strong model from us and in the churches that they go to. And um, the verse is Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. And I also looked up a couple of other um, scriptures about the youth. And one is in 1 Timothy 4.12. I really love this verse. It says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, with in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So that gives us a charge to help those who are in their youth to, um, to believe and to believe in their conduct, in love, in faith, and in spirit, and in purity. And also, um, Ecclesiastes says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. And we also, our church, um, supports the BCM at Dyersburg State Community College, and that's Baptist Collegiate Ministries, and we're going to watch the BCM full circle this morning. While I was interning in the student ministry at Forest Hills, I began to have conversations with Chad about what would it look like for me to go into ministry, and I felt like God was kind of pulling me in that direction, but I didn't really know what that looked like. I threw out the idea of really leaning into some of our BCM ministers that are serving so well on our collegiate campuses across Tennessee. What if we got to hear how God called them to ministry? What was their path toward ministry? How did they do school and serve on campuses? And so we began to plan a trip out across the eastern part of our state. And we met with Jonathan Chapman, who's the BCM director there at East Tennessee State University. And we met for breakfast on May 4th. Uh, and before we knew it, uh, the Lord was working and Jonathan ended up offering Cole a job to serve as an associate at the BCM. Cole came to the BCM at a pivotal time. We had been growing, literally doubling, the last two years before he had arrived. And so becoming our campus missionary and working with us was incredible because he was able to have so much impact on students at the time, uh, not only from an evangelistic standpoint, but from a discipleship standpoint. Through my two years of working at the ETSU BCM with Jonathan, he really showed me uh, what it was like to be in collegiate ministry. But and giving me the opportunities to do ministry, I gained confidence and I understood what it looked like and all the levels of collegiate ministry. And so as I went on from there, I was very confident that this is where God's calling me. So one of the cool things in October of 21, Cole had finished up seminary and an opportunity came available at Belmont. And I was so excited to see him be able to go over there and serve there. Ironically, a little bit later on, Mike is having a conversation with me very similar to Cole about what the future of ministry looks like. Do I need to be doing college ministry, young adult? What does that look like? I was sitting in Jonathan's office, just pouring my heart out, struggling with the call to ministry. I'd love to be mentored by pastors in a local ministry context and learn how to do ministry there. And while I'm pouring out my heart to Jonathan saying, I don't know how we're going to do this. Chad Mize emails Jonathan and says, hey, do you have any students that are graduating that are wanting to learn how to do ministry in a local church context? And Jonathan said, yeah, he's right in front of me. Forest Hills had the privilege of bringing Micah on as one of our first ministry residents. And guess what? Micah is also serving uh, on our college campuses with our collegiate ministry at Forest Hills, where he also gets to serve in the same spaces as Cole Rogers. What I didn't know is that while Cole was serving at the BCM with Jonathan, Cole was discipling Micah. 
Over the course of my years at ETSU, I was invested in by, by many people. Jonathan poured into me, mentored me, and kind of showed me how to live as a believer. And Cole Rogers also poured into me and discipled me, having weekly meetings and showing me what it looked like to be a young man who had responded to the Lord's call and ministry on my life. The investments from the people at the BCM and from other students around me altered the course of my life forever and helped me respond positively to what the Lord was doing in my life. At Forest Hills, we've always believed in collaborative ministry through our local conventions. And the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board has really served to be a catalyst for equipping those that we've sent out and also discipling those that we've sent to college campuses. And in this story, we've really seen all sides of that equation really work for the glory of God, the furtherance of the gospel, and really the equipping of the saints for the work of service in the local church. As Tennessee Baptists give through the cooperative program and the golden offering for Tennessee missions, they make it possible for BCMs to disciple students and also to send them back out as leaders into our local churches here in Tennessee, but also around the world. see the need of our students and our colleges today to be taught the Word of God and to uh, be led farther to uh, missions and work in our associations in our state and in our uh, U.S. of A. May you bless each student, bless each college. May Father, your Word be presented in its truth and in its Word, Father. Bless each one for our offerings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now comes our prayer time for those that uh, we know who may not be here with us today and um, who may be traveling. I know Brother Lynn and Miss Linda are traveling, and Becky's traveling, so we need to remember her as well. And, uh, are there any others that we need? I know Colton, we're going to have special prayer for Colton this morning. That's Aaron's son and Ashley's. So we're going to have a special prayer for him this morning as well. But any others you'd like to mention this morning? Colton. Lisa got to hold him and uh, hold on to him in that time. Uh, she finally laid down about six this morning, and 
I got to walk in prior to while they was repairing or what I call the a hard chair walk anyway. But um, we're thankful. This morning's report is that his blood count is down to 11,400. So that is just, they're calling him a rock star. Um, it is amazing. But um, we are claiming this one in a million instance for a one in a million victory. And that's what we're going to have. But specifically, I ask that you pray for his kidneys and his liver because this chemo could have some side effects. We're going to pray that they're going to get through that. So that's a specific prayer. I ask you to pray for him. We're praising God because he has a team that they're meeting with this morning. Um, all of them are down there, and it will probably be 30 to 40 doctors in the ring. But they are determining the best way forward. But it looks like that it's going to be chemo twice a day for probably up to a month. So we're looking for him to be down there that long. Um, also, uh, there's a possibility of transfusion, um, but that's just something that we'll have to take day by day, and that's okay because they have the supplies there for that. But just um, not only him, but all the people waiting on him and the families, uh, we're, we're just going to claim it. Thank you for being so good to my family. Lisa texted me yesterday and she said to him, praise him, praise him, has been going through her mind. She's been singing it all day. She said, would you please sing it at church? And I said, sure, no problem. When I said the songs about three or four days ago and I'd forgotten, I'd already picked that hymn out. Isn't God good? I had already picked out that hymn for us to sing today. So God already knew. And this is not a surprise to God either. None of this is a surprise to him. And um, so I'm going to read Psalm 139, 13 and 14. You formed me in my inward parts and covered me in my mother's womb. I praise you. And we're going to sing that hymn, praise him, praise him. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. And I looked up fearfully because being a school teacher, when you teach a word, you say fearful means full of fear. But that's not what we need to be. Fearfully means that God made us with respect and with a purpose. And that's when I looked up fearfully. That's what it means. So he made us with respect, reverence, and a purpose. So when we say, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are made for a purpose. And Colton is made for a purpose. And then right across in my Bible, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. So that verse is for Aaron and Ashley. Because I imagine they're brand new little parents and they're young. And I know they have anxieties about this. So right across from that, if you in my Bible, I don't know about your Bible, but where it says, fearfully and wonderfully made, right across is search me, O oh God, and know my anxieties. Know my heart, and know, try me, and know my anxieties. So let's pray for Ashley and Aaron as well. And one more verse before we sing our hymn is uh, Ephesians 3.20. I have this on my, uh, I work from home now, and I have this right next to my computer. This is one of my favorite verses. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or even think, above all that we even ask or even that we think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church, which is us, Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Those two verses, when I read those, I think about Aaron and Ashley and Colton to all generations and how our church is praying for them and praying for them daily. So think, now to him who is able, and we know that God is able, to do exceedingly above all that we ask or all that we think. So let us stand and sing. 
310. Blessed be the name. 310. Amen. We started out with soon and very soon, so let's stand and sing hymn number 291, The King is Coming.
you at her Baptist church this morning. It's good to be with you and to try to fill the pulpit today for Brother Lynn. That's something that's impossible for, I would think, for me to be able to do because Brother Lynn is a fine pastor. He's a great teacher. And I love him and his wife very dearly. And we, I say we was when my wife was with me a short time that we were, she was here. And we love church here at Curve Baptist. And I told you this, I think. But let me just briefly say this. When she came with me and we decided to come here and she said, let's come here. And that thrilled my heart. And so we uh, enjoyed the short time. Y'all have been a very gracious, fine church for us and for me. And everything that's come along and you've done and participated in, and it is just a great joy to have membership and to be a member, to be a worker with a, a hopeful worker with the uh, Curve Baptist Church. So, and uh, this morning we have one of my closest friends as a retired pastor, he and I both, we have a lot in common. His wife was Betty Ann, she passed away this past May, two years ago. She and my wife were very close friends and the pastor's wives uh, uh, breakfast for the Dyer Baptist Association. And he lost his wife, uh, and then Devon I lost my wife. And so he and I correspond with each other. We try to help along the way with each other, two of us old fellows that are retired preachers. And we, uh, I call him and he calls me, and we correspond with each other. We see each other. We go to the pastor and wives' breakfast. Even though we uh, don't have wives, we're either neither one of us pastoring anymore. And I've asked Brother James Hooper, I said, you know, I don't know why I'm going, and I mentioned to that to some of the associational brothers, and they said, you come on. So both of us are still attending the Pastor and Wives breakfast every second Monday morning, fourth Monday morning, along with Brother Lynn and Linda, and we enjoy it so much with being part of the association in that way. Brother James and I got to talking to him about it the other day when we first met. We met years ago one day when he, somehow or other, we were at McDonald at Ripley and I was in there and he came in and we got to talking and sat down with each other and we got to talking and met each other and found out what we were involved with as pastors and everything like, you know, preachers talk about each other, things we involved with in our churches and he has retired this past uh, spring from his church at Emmaus that church where he was I was when I was just beginning of my ministry it was part time on uh, second and fourth Sundays and uh, I had the church first and third Sundays and then I became as I said pastor at Emmaus the second and fourth Sunday. So that gave us an opportunity to uh, preach each Sunday of the month, except when we had a fifth Sunday, we didn't stay home. We went somewhere, we went to go to church that Sunday anyway. But it's good to be uh, uh, knowing Brother James, associated with him and our dire Baptist. He's going to come and speak to you the fifth Sunday of this month for Brother Lynn. And, uh, so I'm coming, of course, I'll be here. And he came today to support me, and and I am certainly be here to support him unless something beyond my measure of knowing that I can't can keep from happening to be here the, this Sunday in the month of September. So it's just great to be with you this morning and to uh, try to bring to you some uh, the message that God has placed upon my heart and to think and to praise our church, I keep up with the, uh, I guess you would call it the uh, uh, emails that come with people in our church. And you're on my prayer list every day of the week, morning and, 
evening before I go to bed. At night, I sit down on my bed and I thank our God for the day that he has given to us as well as in the morning and thank God for what he means to us in our lives. Nothing like being a Christian. Amen. 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 And <clears throat> I'm just thankful that the Lord, I don't know why I asked him like the song, Why Me, Lord? That uh, he called me to preach, but then I tried my best to do what the Lord would have me to do in the years that I have pastored the church somewhere close to 60 years and uh, it's just been great to have been retired and to come in and get to find the fine churches, Kurt Baptist. I knew Brother Lynn, I told you before, I think, he held revival for me at Williams Chapel back years ago and I just loved the man and appreciate him and everything and still do so. We have our good times together. He picks at me and I pick right back sometimes at him. And we, we have a great time together and uh, it's just good to be associated with your church at Curry Baptist. I want to try to think this morning from the book of Philippians for our scripture passage. And we think about life. I know Brother James and I have asked each other, and we've said this, that here we are, we are on up in the age of our uh, lives. We've pastored our churches. We've retired. We've lost our wives. Why am I here, Lord? Why am I here? And I think about it that God has, has a purpose for us. I believe until we close our eyes and death. And Paul, the apostle, was a great man of God. We think about his life when he came to know Jesus as his personal Savior and Lord and trusted him on the road to Damascus. God came to him in such a mighty way that he knew that it was God who had spoken to him and he trusted Jesus as his Savior and Lord. I think about Many of the people, I know Brother James does in his time of ministry, the people that came to know Jesus and trusted him and became members of the congregation in the church where we have pastored. And Paul, the apostle, I want to think about the value and the purpose of life. And there's a verse of scripture that comes to my mind that we uh, think of this morning and I want us to think about it. It's in the book of Philippians, chapter 1 of Philippians, and I want to begin with verse 19 and read through the 24th verse of Scripture. Paul says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectations and Hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Think about that verse of Scripture. Even in the living time of Paul in his days of life, we don't know, any of us know how long we will be here upon this earth. But we do know that in our lives, we want the radiance of Christ to be known by our actions and by the way in which we conduct ourselves and the way we go about living in this life that we might be a witness and a testimony for our great God and Lord. So he says, and look at this 21st verse. This is the verse that I want us to think about this morning if we have a text to think of. A main emphasis. Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me to live. The preposition, preposition to in their means. Personally, I think, to each of us in our lives, for us, for me, for you, for all of us 
who are Christians in this life, we are to live for Christ that it will be seen by the public that people in the world will know and that we might be an example to point Jesus, point people to Jesus Christ that they might be saved. So we're going to think about that verse of Scripture. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live alone in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. And on then the next verse of Scripture, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far what better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. We think about these words that Paul had to say. To me, to live is Christ. This is something that is personal to every one of us to live for Christ. When we become a Christian, when that moment comes in our lives when we recognize that we were lost without Christ, needed a Savior, someone, somewhere, or the Word of God pointed us, conviction of the Holy Spirit or a number of things, but more than likely a great example of a deacon or member, someone led us to the Lord caused us to realize that we were lost. We had no hope without trusting Jesus in this life. Every one of us as Christians, every individual, when the Lord saves everyone whom He saves, I believe He saves them for a purpose. We're to be a witness. We are to tell others about Jesus Christ. And so this was the idea that Paul had and the idea that all of us in our world in which we live today, oh, we need to be witnesses for Christ to a lost and dying world. People need to come to know Jesus before it's too late. Every one of us realize and know that, yes, now our world today is in a mess. We're in a situation where Instead of seemingly, as we all know, and in our prayers we pray, Lord, bring America. We always pray, Lord, bring America closer back to God that we might come to know, that the world might come to know Jesus and we'd have a better place to work in the world to live. None of us can deny that today and now in our lives that our world is in a great deep mess. And Paul realized, for to me to live. In other words, Paul was saying, above everything else in all the world, it's more important to me that I know Christ and I am serving Him and living for Him in this world than anything else. And we think about our worship today and how... It seems that so many people think sometimes it doesn't matter what I do and how I live and whether I go to church or not. But you know, we never know. And you and I, when we think about people in our world, I think about my community right down the road here. Everybody knows where I live. I think of it every Sunday morning. I get in my vehicle and I leave and come to church. People right beside me, around me, do not go to church. I leave and their vehicles are there and when I come back home, they're gone and perhaps some and some maybe still there. And I know people, some have to work Sundays. But just think of how many people are right around us never darken the doors of church. And we, as we go about every day, every week, 
They might say, well, there goes the preacher, or there goes so-and-so, they go into church, but then yet does it have any effect upon their idea of thinking, I need to be in church? Yes, we realize that as Christian people today, uh, we, we need to place our faith and trust in greater in Jesus and follow Him uh, in our lives. Christianity is personal. Your Christianity, my Christianity, in the same God and the same Lord, our attending of the church, coming together in worship, that we might grow in the Christian life. I talk with people sometimes and they think, preacher, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I first of all tell them if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life and save you because all of us are born in sin. And unless we come and trust Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord, somewhere, sometime, somewhere along in our life, we will not be prepared, as Paul says, to die as gain. It's not going to be gain. It's going to be eternity without Christ. But Paul said here, to me, to live is Christ. More important than anything else, that we be found faithful to our church, to our uh, community, to our pastor, most of all to our Lord, that we are serving Him. And going back, sometimes people say, well, preacher, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. It's true we become a Christian when we trust the Lord, the Lord as Savior. But to me, that's, that's the first step. But Christian means Christ-like. We become more and more Christ-like by coming together in fellowship with one another and Christians to grow together to become strengthened as a church and as a community to live for the purpose of lost people. Paul had said, I have accepted Christ as my Savior. I have trusted in Him. I know Him through the power of His Holy Spirit. He is my personal Savior and my personal Lord. And yes, He is to all of us. Not very far from where I am now, living my great my home church, Grace Baptist Church, is where I became a Christian when I was somewhere around 10, 11, or 12 years of age. One of the deacons came in at the end of a revival service that night. And he could tell that I was under conviction and he came and stopped at the pew before after the prayer of benediction and talked to this boy and I said, Jesus is my personal Savior and Lord. And to me it was one of the greatest things as I have had others who become Christian in the ministry in a time when I was a pastor and have said to me that was the greatest decision I ever made in my life. And yes, it is. Yes, it, it was to those some who've already gone home to be with the Lord. One of the greatest things in all the world is to know Jesus. And this was Paul's desire that I might be a servant, that I might be a witness for Christ in my, in my life. It's something practical. It has to do with living. Sometimes people think, well, what am I around here for and what am I doing here? But God has a purpose for us. People in this life, uh, too many gaining the material things of this life, to be a great person to, of, of, uh, with lots of money or with lots of access in life, uh, doing a lot of things in this way, getting popular and all of that sort of thing is the goal, is the God for many people's lives today. But what does it profit? Nothing in the end, eternal. If we don't have Christ Jesus as our Savior and Lord, 
there's no hope for us beyond this life. My wife is, has gone home today to be with the Lord, and I, I miss her so much. I got up this morning getting ready to come to church, and you know, this preacher had been wearing a tie for some while. I got ready, and I got this shirt on, and I put this tie around under this collar, and I went to wrestling with trying to get it up under it. I tried to get everything, and I said, you know, without somebody to help you, like I always had with her, she would help me get things like that. The older we get, we get to the point where we can't, we can't maneuver our arms, and we can't do the things that we once could do when we were younger. But I wrestled with this collar and this tie till I got it fixed, best I could, and I came home. But you know, it's just great to come to be in the house of the Lord to serve Him each and every day of our lives that we come to be here and then to know Him every day when we sit down and we have our prayer time, our devotional time when we just say, Lord, thank you for your love for me. It's great. So we live for Christ. 52 weeks out of the year, 365 days of the, of the year is what we should have our lives. Paul says, to me, to live is Christ. That's the whole goal for our life. And we need to have that goal in our heart and life as Christians today in order to serve our Lord successfully in the way He would have us to do. Is it something impossible for us to do? No. The Lord's always there to help us and to give us His strength and His guidance to be with us. He helps us as we continue to live in this life, sustain life, just like this morning, praying for this little one. God is there. He hears us. He knows. He has that power. But He wants us to be concerned and say, Lord, help those who are in need. I read the little things that come along. I'm not much up on one of these phones yet. <laughs> I'm still trying to learn. But I see the messages that come across. People who need all of us need the power and the direction and the help of the Holy Spirit of God in life in the days that we have. Paul says, it is something as possible for me to live, to live without cause of this. The Holy Spirit, Christ Jesus, lives within us. And we sing the song, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He, walk, he walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me what, how I know He lives? Because He lives within our hearts. Can we truly say to the world and that the world can see within us, that guy is a Christian. That person is someone that I want to follow his leadership not only just because of the fact we don't follow we follow the leadership of our Lord but they are, we are to be the example that would point that person to our God who leads us and guides us all the Christian life is Christ living in life in us that's what makes us Christian the word Christian is you know Christ life and what Paul said, I in my life will want to serve my Lord the best that I can all the way through until he calls me home to be with him. Now we know the life of Paul. He had a tough time. He had, was in prison. He was in prison. Even his life crucified for the fact that he was a Christian. And so, 
He said, even in all of this, for to me to live is Christ. But he also said, to die is gain. Well, when we leave this life, can we know as we realize now in our lifetime? My wife didn't want to die. She wanted to last a while longer. She wanted to stay around. We have six, or I have six great grand boys and girls. She wanted to be around. And I can understand that. But I think about it every day that I sit in the house at home and realize she suffered in pain and misery and agony. And oh, I know what is going on with her now. I know that she is rejoicing with Jesus. For she was ready in her heart to Go to be with the Lord. And this is what Paul is talking about. In his life, in the, in the moments that he lived, he, after his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, when Jesus came into his heart and he realized, oh, what a great thing has come upon me. And knowing that Jesus lives, and I think I mentioned, but we sing, He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. And you ask me how I know He lives in our heart. Oh, it's the greatest thing in all the world to be a follower of Jesus, to be saved, to know Him as personal Savior and Lord. But what are we doing in our lives today as Christians, as churches? Are we pointing to those in our communities who are lost without Christ? One day, you'll stand before Him. One day, you'll give an account of your life. Do you know our Savior? Do you know our Jesus? Do you know our Lord? I'm sure everyone here in this church this morning is a Christian. Most of all of our churches were, we as pastors knew that most of the time our people who came to church were Christian. We had to go out into the homes, into the ways of life and meet with those and talk with those. I talked with a man this past week about his soul's experience, about his his life if he was a Christian or not. And you know, we, we know we can get all kinds of answers. But so a whole many, a lot of people, we as churches sometimes do not stop to think we are a witness of Christ as a member of the church. Our church here, our church is friendly, loving, church and I'm grateful and thankful for that you've shown that to my wife and I for a short time that she got to be with me here you've shown me that and continue to show me that every day every time we think about our church I'm proud to be a member of Curve Baptist Church but oh so many people this morning are lost without Christ. Paul said, for as I'm concerned, to be a Christian is the most important thing in all the world, and it is, to know Jesus, to know who we're going to spend our eternity. And I hope and pray, and we're going to, our song leader is going to come and lead us in a song for our invitation. But as you this morning, as we in our lives think about our Christian experience, I'm sure most people here are already saved this morning, but never forget the world is lost outside. We need to tell people about Jesus.
they might come to know Him. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for this opportunity that we've had to come and try to think about and preach Your Word and think upon the things of life. To know, Father, that we're all born in sin and that we must come and trust Jesus, ask Him to forgive us of our sin. Help us every day in our life, Father, realize it's important how we go about our daily lives, our serving of Jesus. Just as we this morning witnessed for the students in our world today, young people, Father, I pray that you will lead teachers, leaders, pastors, and Father, that all those in our lives, in our world today, that we will come closer to our Lord. May, Father, you lead America in this year, in these next few months. Lead people, Father, to make the choice that would help, that would be what you would have to bring us back closer unto our God. Lead in this service for us in Christ's name, I pray. Amen.